So it's a great pleasure for me to be here. This is my first time in Taiwan, and I'm enjoying myself very much. Everyone has been incredibly welcoming, and I've enjoyed the food, which has more than a little relevance to our discussion today. I will apologize right off the bat. I'm handicapped when it comes to languages. I can just barely speak English, so I hope that you will all forgive me for delivering the presentation. If I'm not being clear about anything I say, uh, please feel free to interrupt me and ask me to explain. I'll do my best uh, to to try and keep it as clear as I can. I know that Jenny has promised to wave at me if I'm not being clear. So I had uh, I heard the the long and I hope very nice introductions. Everybody clapped, but I didn't understand much besides my name. So what I'm going to do is go through just a little bit. Of additional background about the LC Research Foundation, who we are, what do we do, and in particular, give you a little bit of context as to why we work in the area of biotechnology. I know there's a lot of vocabulary that gets thrown around. I, I picked up on some of that from the introduction. Um, in general, I will say biotechnology because it covers a lot of different things that we might want to talk about. But for the purposes of this presentation, it's it's not uh, any different than saying GMOs or genetically engineered organisms or living modified organisms, if you fancy the part of it. Then, for the second part of my presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about the basic principles of food safety assessment. And again, provide a little bit of context about food safety assessment for agricultural biotechnology. I know that Dr. Morgan McLean, who's the executive director of the ILSI Research Foundation, was here just a short time ago. So, if some of you have seen a few of these slides before, I apologize for that. But they're very nice slides that are. Prepared by our communications manager, and I always feel like it's a good idea to include them in the beginning of my talks. So, as as Jenny mentioned, ILSI is a nonprofit organization, and all of the ILSI institutes, no matter where they are, share the same general mission: to provide science that improves human health and well-being, and safeguards the environment. It's a multi-sectoral organization, so that means we involve science from different sectors. For the most part, that's government, the private sector, so industry scientists, and academia, people at research institutions and at universities. And the idea behind that is that you need all of these sectors to be involved if you're going to do the best science to inform important decisions. Including decisions that may have an impact on public policy, and you'll see as an organization, I've been with ILSI for six years now, and I think it's always impressive to me to look around the world and see just how effective and how much work the ILSI organizations do. I think ILSI Taiwan is a very good example. These are all the colorful flags for the different ILSI organizations. I won't go through all of these, except to say that there's lots of them, and each one is independent. But we work together collaboratively as much as we can. I will point out that my institution is this one here, the Ilse Research Foundation. It's actually one of four different Ilse groups that are in Washington D.C. I won't go through all of them, but if people have questions about the organization or the different groups in Washington. I'll be happy to answer those at the end of the lecture. One of the challenges for many organizations and many scientific organizations is explaining to people what it is that they do, and this is also true for ILSI. So, over the last few years, there's been a very concerted effort in trying to better package and explain the body of work that all of the different ILSI groups do. And that's led to the identification of four thematic areas that all of the ILC organizations work on. They range from food and water safety, 
through toxicology and risk science, nutrition, health, and wellness, and then sustainable agriculture and nutrition security. Nutrition security is the new uh, word for food security. The attempt is to incorporate not just calories so that people survive, but also adequate nutrition so that they're able to live healthy lives to their full potential. The reason I put this up here, in, other than to just explain the breadth of scope of the type of scientific efforts that LC is involved in, is that biotechnology and agricultural biotechnology intersects with all of these thematic areas in some way. So I think it's a good illustration of just how important the topic is, because it's going to touch on all of these thematic areas. This is just a very pretty slide. Don't know where the picture was taken, uh, but it's from the United States, and this is a very typical uh, irrigation canal associated with agriculture. What's not typical is that there are beautiful mountains in the background. So I suspect this is somewhere in Colorado, just based on how the mountains look. But I don't know. I didn't take the picture. So the Research Foundation, our mission is very similar to the LC organization broadly, to improve environmental sustainability and human health by advancing science to address real world problems. This is a very American sort of phrase, to address real world problems. But the idea here is to try to tell people that we don't work on research science. We're not interested in knowledge for the sake of knowledge. We're interested in applied knowledge, things that are useful to help people make decisions that are going to impact the public. As Jenny was explaining, it's distinct from all of the other ILSI organizations. We are the, the one ILSI group that doesn't have members. All of our money comes through grants and donations. Um, it's important, though, to point out that we use the same approach as all of the LC organizations. We involve multi-sectoral scientists in all of our work. Because people tend to care about this, this is a slide from the 2015 LC Research Foundation annual report showing where we get our money. About 75%, 75-80% comes from public sector grants. Right now, for my groups within the Research Foundation, the largest two donors are the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the U.S. Agency for International Development. We've also had large grants from the World Bank, from the governments of Australia, the government of the Netherlands. Um, we're very uh, accepting of funds, provided the donors are willing to operate under the ILC model, and their mission aligns well with ours. About 15% of our funds are from the private sector. My groups have a relatively large grant from CropLife International, which constitutes most of our private sector funding at this time. And then we do get some funding from international organizations. So how we work, again, this will be very familiar to those of you who are familiar with LC organizations. We lead collaborative research projects, and we do that primarily by convening experts to talk about issues that may be challenging for them to deal with on their own, or may require them to meet in groups, particularly multi-sectoral groups. And we facilitate those conversations that may be challenging for other organizations to have. All of these are about scientific issues and normally scientific issues that are relevant for public policy. I'm not going to talk extensively about how the Research Foundation is organized. I don't expect that many of you are interested in our organizational chart. But I will point out that a few years ago, the Research Foundation adopted a center model. So the large ongoing programs are operated by individual centers. And these centers are expected to be self-funding through grants. Right now, as it happens, I'm the director of two, and that's the Center for Environmental Risk Assessment and the Center for Safety Assessment of Food and Feed. What those two centers have in common is that most of their work focuses on 
assessments related to agricultural biotechnology. The other center, I need to take a deep breath, is the Center for Integrated Modeling of Sustainable Agriculture and Nutrition Security. So we like to just say SIMSING. This group is headed by Dr. Dave Gustafson, and they do a lot of work on nutrition modeling. Dave is a computer modeler with a climate science background. They do a lot of very interesting work. I can talk a little bit about what SimSans does, but the best I can probably do is refer you to Dave for any questions you might have. It's also worth pointing out that ILC does have, the Research Foundation does have other programs, including work on a global nutrition strategy that is supposed to be for all of the ILC organizations, something called Take 10, which is an exercise program for children in schools, uh, and we also have an effort on open data, looking at making more data available to people so that it can be used for maximum benefit. This is the very nice communications group slide on the Center for Safety Assessment of Food and Feed, and I'm primarily going to be speaking as the director of the Center for Safety Assessment of Food and Feed. The mission of that group is to promote science-based approaches to safety assessments for food and for feed, with a strong emphasis on improved knowledge dissemination and capacity. So this is, the purpose of the center is mostly communication of science to people who can benefit from it in making decisions. This is a, a list of some of the activities that we're currently undertaking. Just to give you an idea, I do more than just wander around the world talking about biotechnology. So we have a project developing protein monographs. This is a confusing title. But these are reviews of safety information that is publicly available for particular proteins that are commonly used in genetically modified plants. There's four of them right now. They're all currently under peer review. And they will be published, I hope, very soon. Once I get back to Washington, I need to review the comments from the peer reviewers. But our hope is to put them up on the, the LC Research Foundation website. None of the information is new research, and it's all from publicly available information sources. But these documents are very useful for people as a starting point. If they're interested in a particular protein or a particular biotech product, you can find a lot of references and information. We're also working on a book that explains the fundamentals and a little bit of the technical details about how you do food safety for biotechnology. We refer to it as a retrospective because it started life as a, a, a look back through time at the history of food safety assessment for biotechnology. But it's grown a bit since then and we'll have more forward-looking elements to it. Writing a book is very challenging. This is my first experience managing that process. We're hoping to have a mature draft by the end of the year. And then finally, one of the programs that we've had success with in the past and are planning for the future is a toxicology training program. This is, again, toxicology related to food safety assessment for biotechnology. And it is a, a two-phase training course. There's a week of concepts and principles. This is classroom training with practical exercises that normally takes place in country. The last time we did it was in India, and we'll be doing it again in Indonesia. And then the second week is a practical experience where we bring people to the United States and have them visit a food safety laboratory where these types of tests are conducted routinely so they can see how those tests are done and talk to the people who who perform them. And again, I'll be happy to answer any questions about these, cognizant of the fact that I'm probably taking too much time. We do a lot of capacity building. That is the overarching purpose for the center. I just want to point out a couple of large capacity building programs that have been run through the ILSU Research Foundation. We have a very large USAID-funded program that operates in India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. And then our World Bank-funded program was a, 
a four-year program with nine partner countries and partnerships with both the World Bank and with the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It was a big program. You can see the countries listed here that were involved. Okay, so I've done my duty as an officer of the Research Foundation explaining to you what it is and what we work on. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more directly about this subject of interest for this symposium. But I always like to start off by asking and answering, hopefully, the question of why are we working in this area? Why does the Ilse Research Foundation, which is a public charity organization for science in the United States, address this area? Well, we aren't a product developer. We're not making anything. We're not trying to sell you anything related to biotechnology. And we're not a lobbying organization. This is very important for our tax status in the United States, but it's a defining characteristic of the organization. I am not here to tell you what Taiwan should do with respect to agricultural biotechnology. Our mission is to help provide science so that people are well informed for the decisions that they need to make. We don't advocate for the adoption of technologies or policies in general. That's up to you to decide. It's up to the government and to the stakeholders here in Taiwan to decide how you feel about biotechnology. But we do have a mission to advance science. And this is an area where the science is often very confused. And it's confused by different stakeholders. And there's a lot of noise in the environment about what is biotechnology and how you should be looking at it. So we, we address this by trying to help bring the best science that we can gather as a convening organization and as an expert organization to help people understand and put the decisions that they need to make in context. As a general rule, we believe it's a fundamental principle for our organization that science is needed to inform good public policy. So I think the next logical question is, what is the impact of biotechnology on sustainable food security? I think the issue of food safety will increasingly need to be addressed in the context of food and nutrition security. It's something that you can't deal with in isolation. So biotechnology, GMOs, any technology, is a tool. It's something you use to accomplish a goal. Like any other tool, you have to use it responsibly in order to get a benefit from it. It's not a single product or idea. It's not just something that large multinational companies do. It's not just something that research scientists do. It's a tool that has many different uses. It's not good or bad by itself. It's the applications of the technology that are potentially beneficial. And I think if you look at the evidence in the world today from the uses of biotechnology, particularly in agriculture, there's very strong evidence that this is a tool that is making substantial contributions to sustainable agriculture and to sustainable food security. I'm going to walk through a, slides, a few slides just giving you a very broad idea of what sort of contribution is being made. But I think it's worth noting that future products, products that maybe we haven't even thought of yet, also hold promise in this area. So this is one of three, so that if you're bored, you know how many slides I'm going to go through of benefits. And again, I'm not here as a technology advocate, but one of the things that is frequently forgotten is that we look at the risks of technologies that we want to use because we see a need for them. If we just don't want them, we don't need to do a safety assessment. We just say no, and we don't use them. So herbicide-tolerant crops are one very well-known application of agricultural biotechnology. And it's worth mentioning that these have contributed greatly to the increased use of low tillage practices, particularly in the United States and Canada, where I'm from, but also in South America. This has a very real benefit for reducing erosion and conservation of soil nutrients. It 
has had a very significant impact on agriculture, certainly in my country. Insect-resistant maize, this is usually Bt maize. People talk about Bt proteins a lot. One of the benefits of Bt maize that was surprising to some people is that the reduction in insect damage leads very directly to a reduction in fungal invasion of corn. And that leads to lower levels of mycotoxins. I don't know how many of you are familiar with mycotoxins, but these are a very serious problem, particularly in maize production. They're poisonous, and you don't want them in your food, but people are becoming increasingly aware of uh, chronic exposure problems and levels of mycotoxins uh, causing issues beyond just acute toxicity. So it's an area that gets a lot of attention. And it's certainly an area that in the United States, insect-resistant maize has provided a tremendous benefit to reducing mycotoxins. If you're a farmer and you care about the quality of your food and the return that you get on your investment, this is very important. There's a very famous example in Hawaii of a virus-resistant papaya. This was a very early biotechnology product in the United States. It was developed at Cornell University to deal with papaya ring spot virus, which is a very significant problem in papaya production. To make a long story short, if it wasn't for the virus-resistant biotech papaya, there would be no papaya production in the islands of Hawaii today. Even organic papaya is grown in Hawaii surrounded by biotech bi resistant papaya in order to reduce the viral load that the organic production is exposed to. This is a very important tool and it has had a real impact on the preservation of an entire industry in that state. And something that was surprising to me when I worked at the Department of Agriculture. They conduct a lot of surveys of farmers to find out why they make the decisions that they make. And the number one answer that farmers gave as to why they adopted, in particular, herbicide tolerant crops, it wasn't weed control. It was that the flexibility in managing weeds meant the farmer didn't need to spend so much time sitting on the tractor. So if you're a farmer in the United States and you have many thousands of acres, that involves a lot of just sitting on a tractor and driving it over all of those acres. And it turns out that getting off of that tractor to spend time with your family or do other things that benefit your business is very important to you. So the flexibility of the timing of herbicide applications that you get with an herbicide tolerant plant was very appealing to farmers for that reason. And I point this out because it's a different way of thinking about the technology. Maybe it's only interesting to me. But this, is, this flexibility in management has led to a reduction in greenhouse gases in addition to the benefits to conservation practices, soil conservation practices that I mentioned before. So the point I'm trying to make here is that these are very different products from each other, and they provide very different benefits to the people who use them. But the reason farmers and producers are using these technologies is because they do have a substantial benefit. This is just a list of some crops that are under development. I'm probably behind time here, so I won't go through them all. The point is we'll be seeing more nutritionally improved varieties We'll be seeing more varieties that are resistant to drought and abiotic stresses. These will benefit increasingly poor farmers in developing countries. And I think it's important that in developed countries, we have a responsibility to manage the risks that are associated with these technologies appropriately so that we don't damage the potential for future applications to provide benefits to people who need them probably more than we do. 
So this is one of my favorite themes. We do, we, uh, especially in South Asia, we have a, a long presence, and I spend a lot of time in Bangladesh. And I see the issue that people approach regulation as if it was a prohibitive activity. Regulation is meant to stop bad things. But I think it's important to understand that you stop bad things by banning them. You don't regulate stealing, right? You, you had a, a very uh, sensational bank robbery here in Taiwan over the last few days. You don't regulate bank robberies. You ban them. It's a crime. It's something bad. There's nothing good about it, so it's prohibited. Things that you regulate, you see a benefit from. There's a reason why you want these things. You put the regulations in place to make sure that while you're getting what you want, you're doing it in a safe way, in a way that doesn't cause damage or harm to other things that you care about. We regulate food safety not because food is bad, but because we want it to be safe. Right? Um, the only thing more dangerous than your food is not eating any. There are a lot of hazards associated with food, right? We can't eliminate them all, but we work to make sure that the food is as safe as possible for people to consume. So our programs, our scientific and technical support programs, are designed, they're intended to help people get access to the information, the science that they need to effectively regulate and ultimately make decisions, both about environmental risk assessment and food safety assessment for biotechnology. And again, the reason we do that is so that countries can advance their own policies about the technology. So, why do we conduct food safety reviews? I think this is something that always surprised me a bit when I got into the business of agricultural biotechnology. So I'm just going to walk through a little bit of, a, of background. I'm hoping that Jenny will cut me off if I go over time. Yeah. So, food safety is agreed as a fundamental public health concern uh, for at least the last 120 years or so. This has been a very universal goal, and it's been a government goal for national governments to ensure a safe food supply. Pretty much everywhere in the world has this in common. There are a lot of challenges to safe food and maintaining a safe food supply. We have very fluid patterns of global consumption. People are moving around, foods are moving around. People are changing the things that they like to eat. We have increasing amounts of international trade. I think that's very relevant here in Taiwan. So what is on your plate probably didn't come from here. And you need to know where it came from and what they're doing with it before it gets here. We're increasingly using all kinds of different technologies in both agricultural production as well as food processing and food production. But we also are dealing with a very challenging social dynamic, which is the changing expectations that people have around food safety. Even 25 years ago, people didn't worry so much about what was in their food and where it came from. And as countries are becoming wealthy, People have the time and the energy to think about lots of things that may have been considered esoteric, unimportant years ago, but they, they're concerned with them now. And as we all know, food can be a very emotional issue. So I think it helps, sorry, I should have changed this. I, I gave a presentation on gene editing, but this applies just as well to GMO. To put these foods in context of other foods and how we treat their safety. So people began growing their own food instead of just collecting it from nature about 12,000 years ago. That's a while. Since then, all they've done is breed those plants to make new and more beneficial varieties for themselves. If you look at a maize plant, it looks absolutely nothing like its ancestor. It's, you wouldn't guess that they were related plants. 
The same can be said for most of what we eat. Just by way of example, because maize is very important in the United States, USDA maintains an accession library with close to 20,000 different varieties of maize. That's just one agricultural crop and just one collection. What's important is that not one of those 20,000 varieties has ever been subject to a safety assessment. Zero. Because we've been eating maize for a long time. So it begs the question, how do we know that these foods are safe? What is before agricultural biotechnology came along, why did we think it was safe to eat maize? Is there evidence that it's safe to eat maize? And I think as a scientist, these are cultural reasons why we think food is safe, but they're certainly not evidence of food safety by themselves, right? So this is the context that you need to have. Historically, we think foods are safe based almost entirely on tradition and cultural experience. If my father ate maize and his father ate maize, then it's probably okay for me to eat maize. And that is how we make decisions about foods that are appropriate. Very, very few foods that are eaten today have been subject to any study, uh, any toxicological study. And that includes some foods that have poisons in them and need to be very carefully prepared. Cassava is a very good example. This is eaten widely, and it's toxic. If you eat a raw cassava, you're going to get sick. You need to prepare this very carefully, but people do. These are generally accepted as safe. Cassava is not a regulated food in the United States. You can eat it. You can sell it to people. Even foods with toxins or anti nutrients or allergens are considered safe because of a long history of use. The peanut is my favorite. It has become a villainous product in the United States. There are increasing numbers of children who have peanut allergies, and some of them are very severe. So it's a serious public health concern. I eat a peanut butter sandwich almost every day for work. In order to get that peanut butter sandwich, I go to the store and I grab off the shelf an unmarked, unlocked, unregulated can of peanut butter and I take it home with me. It's labeled that it has peanuts in it because it's a known allergen. But the sale and use of these products is not restricted. It's not restricted by FDA in the United States. The point that I'm making is that food safety regulations historically, at least up until 1986, were based almost entirely on an assumption that the foods themselves are safe and that what we're worried about is microbial contamination or chemical contamination in those foods. So that is the context for food safety assessment of biotechnology. This is a paragraph from the Codex Alimentarius guidelines that deal with food safety assessment for foods derived from GE plants. I'm not going to read this, and I don't expect you to, to read it either, but this is verification of everything that I just said. So just to convince you that I'm not up here making wild claims about food safety, if you read this paragraph, section one, paragraph three, it says exactly the same thing. Historically, food safety has ignored the safety of the food itself and focused on chemical and microbial contaminations. So when people decided, for better or for worse, that they were going to do food safety assessment for agricultural biotechnology, they had to create a brand new process for looking at the safety of whole food. Looking at the safety of the food itself. And over the last 25 years, this has led to lots of new science being produced because we haven't studied the safety of whole foods before. It's important 
to recognize that this was at least partially the decision to regulate biotechnology and create a whole new safety assessment paradigm was at least partially in response to public pressures. It wasn't based on evidence of safety concerns with existing biotech products. When they made these decisions, there were no existing biotech products. The earliest government regulators in Europe and in Canada and in the United States, around 1986, 1987, they started to build these frameworks. The perception among the public is that somehow these foods are new and different than other foods. They're not like the food that my father ate. So at least somebody should look at them somehow. And the public is very good at providing feedback, but they're not always good at giving you the specific steps that you need to do to satisfy uh, their concerns. So they just wanted someone to look and tell them that the foods were safe. I don't normally include slides like this because, again, I'm not an advocate for uh, any particular technology. But on Thursday, two weeks ago, as I was the day I was preparing these presentations, I walked out of my building and down the street to lunch, interestingly to a restaurant that's been having all kinds of microbial contamination issues. And I passed this car, so I took this picture with my phone. And it just illustrates so perfectly the point of these slides. This is a car that somebody built themselves. They made this. This is supposed to be a sugar beet that looks like a fish. It's a bit of a stretch. It's got all kinds, oops, I'm sorry. It's got all kinds of propaganda on it about labeling GMO foods. And the catchphrase here, I don't know if you can see this, is fishy food. So in English, that's a pun. Fishy means suspicious. And so it also makes people think of fish. And in the early days, there were a lot of rumors about people taking genes out of fish and putting them into biotech plants. So this was very uh, appealing to the public imagination. There is a GM sugar beet in the United States. It has nothing to do with fish. There's no fish involved at all. The point I'm making is that public concern is something we all need to address. And we should address that. I think that's important as a scientist. And I think for governments, especially in democratic countries, it's important to address public concerns. But we should understand that public concerns are not always well informed by science. So the paradigm for conducting biosafety assessments or, and food safety assessments for GM plants was refined, it was first evolved in the 1980s and refined through the 1990s by different national governments and then internationally at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, and eventually uh, an internationally agreed guideline on food safety assessment was adopted at COVAX. And this is the, the number for it here, so you have that reference. The paradigm, again, is for the safety assessment of a whole food. It's comparative by necessity because nobody can say with any certainty how safe is corn. The idea behind these assessments was to look at a new corn, a biotech corn, and say, is this as safe as existing corn or not? The biotech food is compared with regard to certain specific characteristics that have been identified. And if there are differences, that doesn't mean that the biotech product is unsafe. It means that those differences are investigated to determine if they make a difference with respect to food safety. This is my very highly simplified overview of the codex outline. It would be irresponsible to suggest that this is what is in the Codex Guidelines. But these are the bullet points from the chapter headings, just to give people an idea of what that, go, what that guideline looks like. A lot of time and energy goes to looking at expressed substances. You will hear these referred to as novel substances or introduced substances. For the most part, these are proteins, and these are the new proteins that are introduced by the transgene. 
The way those are assessed is by looking at toxicity and allergenicity. And it's a combination of laboratory tests, particularly acute toxicity tests, and bioinformatics, looking at sequence comparisons to known toxins or allergens. It's also worth mentioning here that acute toxicity is generally uh, the subject of these studies because proteins are normally acutely toxic if they're going to be toxic. They don't have uh, chronic exposure toxicity. They also look at compositional analysis of key components. This is largely just to demonstrate substantial equivalence, that the new corn looks pretty much like corn. It's not that each and every component needs to be proven to be identical to the component of the, the comparator. It's just to show that you see things that look similar to what you would expect to see with the conventional variety. And I will talk a little bit more about this when you have to listen to me lecture again on some of the resources that we maintain in the research package. If it's an enzyme, you look at the metabolic products and you may also consider how it interfaces with food processing. This turns out to be very easy. In most processed products, the proteins don't survive. Um, so it falls out of the assessment very quickly. And you may look, depending on the crop, or depending on the plant or the food, at nutritional modifications. So if, if this is an important source of a critical vitamin, you might want to consider whether the biotech product has affected that product. This group up here, the expressed substances, are generally categorized as the results of the intended changes. And the group down here are generally considered to assess for the possibility of unintended changes. That's not 100% true, and it may be less true over time, particularly as more products are introduced that have intended compositional changes. But as a ballpark idea, it's mostly true. This is very important because the subject of unintended changes can be very controversial with relation to biotechnology. So I just point that out. So I'm coming to the end of my lecture. I hope I'm not over time. These are a few conclusions. Mostly I put these up here to remind myself what I talked about uh, and hopefully to facilitate questions. Biotech foods have been around for the last 25 years or so, uh, certainly longer than some of you in the audience have been around. The evaluation process was designed because there was no historic whole food safety assessment methodology. What has been developed is a comparative assessment between conventional or existing, pre-existing foods and their biotech counterparts. Special consideration is given to any new substances introduced as well as the composition. And I think What's interesting about this is that it is a new paradigm for whole food safety assessment. And if you have other whole foods that you're interested in doing safety assessments for, regardless of whether they're made with biotechnology or not, you can apply these principles to doing whole food safety assessment. I think that becomes important when you're talking about some of the newer technologies that people are thinking about. Thank you very much for your attention.